on the scene He's got the voice that's mean Asking those questions that you never seen He's got that fire Burning bright and clean Andrew Keen Making waves Break the routine On the keen on show He brings the heat Asking the minds Digging deep till they bleed No sugar coated truths No lies to deceive Andrew Keen The master of the interview beat the knowledge he's got the flair challenging ideas with a fearless stare with every question he's uncovering what's there andrew key the true seeker he's aware hello everybody a couple of years ago in november of 2022 we did a show with the very distinguished uh, observer of putin's russia mark galliotti uh, it was a show about how putin thinks like a warmongering 19th century imperialist and why, at least according to Galeotti, uh, Ukraine will be his last colonial war. Um, Galeotti had just come out with a new book, Putin's Wars from uh, Chechnya to Ukraine. Uh, two years later, Galeotti is back. I guess in a way Putin's back. We'll talk about that during the show. Uh, Galeotti has a new book, Forged in War, A Military History of Russia from Its Beginnings to Today. The constant theme in the two books, of course, is war itself, whether it's Putin's war or forged in war. Russia seems to be all about war. Mark Galeotti is joining us from Broadstairs in Kent, not a military front, a very pleasant part of Southeast England. Uh, Mark, has anything changed? We haven't talked for a couple of years. It's nice to see you again. Has anything changed fundamentally over the last couple of years in terms of how you see either Putin or Russia? No, I mean, I think that, fingers crossed, it doesn't mean any more wars, but I think the basic assumptions that actually Ukraine is proving so disruptive and so damaging to his military apparatus that it probably will be his, his last such war has been sort of continues to, to hold true. But above all, I mean, certainly this, this notion that he has of the world, this 19th century geopolitical notion of the world, I think is absolutely hold, held true. That he doesn't really believe that a country like Ukraine can act on its own, that he sees the world purely in terms of a handful of countries that give the orders and an overwhelming majority who take them. I mean, that is still, even now, and this is a man who clearly doesn't learn lessons easily, even now still seems to occupy his 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 headspace when he tries to understand how the world works. He still thinks in those 19th century terms. Well, your book is the new book, Forged in War, a military history of Russia from its beginnings today, from from its beginnings to today, it goes back way beyond the uh, the 19th century. It begins in what you call the forging of Russia, the the wars of what the 15th and 16th century. Um, this is not a history lesson, uh, Mark, but is everything about Russian history associated with war? Is that your reading? Is that the point of this new book, Forged in War? I would say everything is associated with insecurity. I think there's two key points to make. One is that Russia has perennially felt insecure, doesn't have natural borders. It's in Eurasia. It's at the crossroads between Europe and Asia, and therefore more or less whichever is the rising military power of the age, whether we're talking about the Mongols in the 14th century or Napoleon at the beginning of the 19th century, at some point will decide they have to go through Russia. So, you know, despite its relative poverty and so forth, the Russians feel they're constantly at threat. And as a result, they have to build a war fighting state. So it's not that they're always at war, but they always have to worry about war. They always have to be thinking about war. And when you think about war all the time and you build your state around it, you probably will get into more fights because the philosophy has often been, as Putin himself said, you know, when he re reflected on the lessons that he learned running with youth gangs in sort of still half ruined Leningrad during his childhood, if you're going to get into a fight, you throw the first punch. So I think that's been Russia's really history. It's a history of what one could almost call aggressive defensiveness that it feels a threat, and therefore it tends too often to decide that it has to throw the first punch. It's all about boxing then. Um, two of the characters who everyone associates with Russia, Peter the Great and Catherine the Great, they were both considered enlightened leaders, although they were despotic in their own way. How does uh, 
Peter and Catherine, particularly Peter, fit into this narrative? I mean, of course, he was, in a sense, himself forged by war, but it was more than just war. I mean, he had an ideal of innovation and perhaps even uh, Russian integration into Western civilization. How would you place both Peter and Catherine in, in your narrative in this new book? Yeah, it's a really interesting question, not least because Putin himself tends to draw comparisons between himself and historical figures, especially including those two particular greats. I think he, he sings, sees himself as being a future of Vladimir the Great. Peter the Great, absolutely, he was he believed in modernizing, but he was a very much a, a man of his hands. He was a practical man. He wasn't really interested in modernizing the whole of society, especially not the institution of czarism. He wanted to make sure that he could get the Western technology he needed. So, for example, you know, he travels through Europe, first czar ever to do so. Particularly, he goes to Holland and to Britain at the times, the great cradles of naval technology, because he wants Russia to have a fleet. And he hires captains and naval architects and shipwrights and so forth. He also goes and takes a look at Parliament when he's in London and leaves saying Russia is not ready for democracy. So I think this is it. What 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 Peter wanted was all the, the shiny military technologies of the age without the massive political and economic and social infrastructure that actually supported that. He just thought he could transplant it, which, again, is actually quite 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 a Putinist notion that basically you just simply copy or buy the technologies you want. And you don't have to worry about the innovation, the investment or everything that went in behind it. And as regards Catherine the Great, a woman who at one point said, I have no way of defending my borders except by expanding them, which again might be a, uh, a motto that, that Putin would, would warm to. She too, I mean, she was actually much more thoughtful, I mean, herself, I mean, she was actually of German origin, and she did want to see a Russia that was more closely integrated with the West. She wanted to see more Western ideas being interpreted across the country. But even then, not at the expense of her own power. She was absolutely certain that nothing could limit the autocracy of the empress. So, again, I think you know, what really comes out from this is there were some extraordinary, vigorous and dynamic figures in, in Russian history. But firstly, they were always war fighters. I mean, both, both Peter and, and Catherine. Although that's not necessarily what they set out to be, in practice, their reigns were marked by constant conflicts. But secondly, their idea of what a Western country looked like tended to start with military capabilities rather than social structures, laws, or any of the other sort of substructure behind it. To what extent Catherine, Peter, and perhaps these early Russian rulers, to what extent did their obsession with war and their... Uh, their view of the world, which was bound up with war, colour, I use that word carefully, their notion of building a, a, a Russian state. In other words, was there a distinction between the principles governing Russia's view of the outside world from the internal world? The, the, the anecdote that comes to mind here is uh, Catherine the Great's decision to bring in a, a, a Western consultant, kind of a, a Mark Galliotti of 200 years ago, <laughs> Samuel, uh, Samuel Bentham, Jeremy Bentham's brother, who came in to develop what has now be, been popularly known as, as Bentham's uh, panopticon, the idea of prisons or schools or hospitals where you could watch over everything. Some people see this as the beginnings of what now is known as surveillance capitalism. In other words, was war itself viewed by most of these early Russian rulers, not just externally, but also internally in terms of their relations with, quote unquote, the citizens of Russia, although, of course, they had very few rights as citizens. Mm. Well, the whole issue of rights actually is at the heart of, the, of this, this whole point. It's worth noting in terms of bringing in foreigners. I mean, again, that has a long uh, trajectory behind it. If one looks at the Kremlin, and look at the Kremlin walls, so it's this red brick structure with these very, very sort of distinctive, tall, high, what are called swallowtail uh, battlements, very similar to the Sforza Castle in the middle of Milan, because it was built by the same person. You know, even way back, Ivan the Terrible 
actually brought in military architects from above all, but not entirely from Italy, just as he brought in you know, engineers from, say, Germany, because that was how you got the technology often. You just simply hire the people who got it. So you know, long tradition. But yes, look, if you think that you are constantly at threat and therefore, and you have long, hard to defend borders, and you're often going to be facing an enemy that is more technologically advanced or more numerous. Well, you, you need to find ways of building up your forces. If you don't have naturally those kind of resources, and one of the problems for Russia is it doesn't go through an agrarian revolution. Getting very much in the weeds here, I apologize. But, you know, if you one looks at the You're the, allowed the to get in the weeds, uh, Mark. Brilliant. Right. Well, that's much appreciated. Well, you know, the industrial revolution that, that reshaped Europe was really on the back of the agrarian revolution. Because once new techniques and technologies meant that farmers could produce more crop on the same land, you have more surplus, which supports trade, investment, and industry, and cities. Now, Russia can't get go through that agrarian revolution, courtesy of the nature of its soils, the climate, and so forth. Beginning of the 19th century, agricultural productivity is pretty much still at medieval levels. So if you're gonna find the money to build up your armies and bring in your foreign experts and such like, and you haven't got a naturally expanding burgeoning economy, the only way you can do it is by taxing it all the harder, extracting more from your own people. And slavery, essentially, wasn't it? Yeah, exactly. Surf well, it wasn't was just essentially, it was slavery, slavery no different yeah. from, from American uh, slavery uh, up until the middle of the 19th century. Sure. And, and because obviously people resist that often, you actually also have to be willing to go in and stamp very hard on them to deter them from rising but, but again. Mark, I mean, every state, the United States, uh, the Tudor Britain, um, post-revolutionary Russia, uh, sorry, post-revolutionary France, all the supposed bastions of democracy, they also grew up in war too. I mean, uh, so there was nothing inevitable, was there, about the dismissal or the just the, the the complete uh the complete avoidance of any kind of democratic development in Russia well no I mean again I, I don't believe in inevitabilities in history anyway but look you're absolutely right that you know all early states are basically war fighting machines they're they're about raising taxes to spend on knights or in due course mus musketeers or whatever else. The point is that actually most states are then able to start to start to outgrow that. It's not that they lose their militaries, but they begin to do all sorts of other things too. And it often precisely is industrial development, economic development, that actually is, is a crucial part of that. Russia never quite gets to that, or you know, for most of its history, Russia has not been able to get beyond that, that point. It's still having to basically, or feels it has to sink a huge proportion of its economy into keeping its military up to strength because it feels so un under threat compared with other places. So in some ways, that's the point. It's about when you can diverge. Now, my basic thesis is that you know, at a certain point, Russia was able to diverge, and particularly from the 20th century onwards, it really ought to have been able to, to break out of old thinking about the threats it faced. But for various reasons, which I go into in the book, it's not able to do so. And Putin himself hasn't been able to do so. But it doesn't mean that, therefore, this is somehow encoded in Russian DNA. And I think you know that, that there have been all kinds of moments, whether we're talking about Gorbachev and his attempt to, to, to build a new relationship with, with the West, in part by massive disarmament, or other times before and, and since. You know, Russia will constantly be faced with options, just that, unfortunately, Although with Putin, originally, when he first came to power, there was some thought that maybe he did actually represent a different type of leader. He's very much sunk himself back into past patterns. Past patterns that, frankly, now don't really make sense in the modern world. Well, we're going to get to Putin in a few minutes. Um, David Runciman, fellow British historian, has an excellent podcast, uh, imagining scenarios that didn't happen and seeing how they would change history. I wonder, in terms of Russian history, what would have happened, Mark, had Napoleon been successful in his invasion of Russia at the beginning of the 19th century? Might the whole history of Russia have been different? Might 
we see more democracy in the same way as we see it in much of the rest of Europe, where Napoleon was actually successful? Well, I mean, look, it's it's a good question. It's one that obviously you, you, you've dropped straight on me. My My gut response is actually... I'm unconvinced for the simple reason, well, two things, reason. One is to actually be successful, for, for Napoleon to really have controlled Russia would, would have required a constant and massive deployment of force. Um, and to be honest, this was a time when anyway, Napoleon's empire was overextended. In order to do that, then frankly, France and the other territories under French control would again, would have had to have been militarized the way that Russia has been. Which would have therefore kind of required a, a, a lot more sort of, shall I say, anti-democratic process. But more to the point, I cannot see how it would have worked. The interesting thing is that when Napoleon took Moscow, Russia's main city, he was basically working on the the, the European political etiquette of the time. That when you, when when the other country has has taken your main city, you sue for peace. And he sat there in Moscow, becoming increasingly exasperated as the Russians refused to do that, as if they didn't understand the rules of the game. They were so barbaric. And indeed, in due course, he's forced to withdraw at massive cost to, to his Grande Armée. And I think in this, this this really shows the point that in fact it's very hard for a country to sort of actually defeat Moscow in you know on on that kind of a scale you can inflict defeats upon russia but to actually conquer russia you require the kind of, of effort that say the mongols or the other end of history adolf hitler had had put together to, to at least you know have a have a chance and that requires you to basically completely structure your whole system around war fighting the way that both the mongols and nazi germany were so, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not convinced that it was possible, but if so, I think we would have seen a very, very different kind of France, which may well not have been sustainable. But if it was sustainable, I think it would have been very unpleasant because exactly it would have been a militarized super state. Let's briefly talk about this window between the defeat of Napoleon and the Bolshevik revolution of the early 20th century. Of course, the most notable moment was the dissolution of, 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 of serfdom but most, most non-experts, Mark, see this as a period of, of, of great political decline in Russia, where the, the institution of czarism declined on lots of levels. Um, in terms of this hundred years, uh, where there was between Napoleon, I guess, and the First World War, relative peace, although there were wars um, associated with the Ottoman Empire, um, what happened in Russia for the, for these hundred years, and how does it fit into your narrative of, of of Russia being forged in war when there actually isn't war? Well, I mean, as you say, that there are a, a lot of wars, including p putting down. I mean, actually, Tsar Nicholas the First becomes known as the Gendarme of Europe because he deploys his armies to put down risings, particularly through eighteen forty eight across Europe. And of but course, there is the Crimean War, conveniently forgotten given absolutely shameful well, history in Britain. But the, here's the interesting thing. It's that you have almost like a pendulum swing within Russia of as it, always defined by security. But where do you see the biggest security risk? Is the biggest security risk external attack or is it internal insurrection? And if you think the, the, the biggest risk is from without, then you're usually much more concerned about your technological backwardness and you start to try and modernize. But of course, modernization is inherently destabilizing for any system. And therefore, it often leads to rising terrorism, insurrection. And then what tends to happen in Russia is all of a sudden you think, no, actually, no, the real risk is at home. And we need to just try and hold things down and basically be much more conservative and essentially just, just rely on what we have. And this is what happened in the 19th century is that at first, with the defeat of Napoleon, the Russians are able to tell themselves to a degree falsely, we're all right. Actually, we, we, we have taken on the, the ogre who trounced so many other European powers. It shows that actually we're not as weak as we thought and that therefore we can focus on keeping things quiet at home. And remember that Tsar Nicholas I came to power amidst a, a rising by his own um, members of his own army. So he was always terrified of that. He has a very bad rep as a kind of 
unthinking conservative, I actually have a slight soft spot for him in that he understood that, for example, serfdom was both morally evil as well as economically bankrupt. But just he never dared do anything about it because he thought his job was to try and keep everything quiet. But then when the Crimean War comes along in the 1850s, the impact of Russia's technological backwardness becomes painfully evident. I mean, you have Russian artillery being outranged by British rifles. And the fact that because the British and the French, who are the most technologically advanced military powers of the age, were using steamships and railways, whereas most Russian troops actually just simply had to march their way to, to the um, battlefield, that even though this is a war being fought in southern Russia, southern Russian empire, I should say, I'm making no comments about modern geopolitics there. Nonetheless, actually, a, a battalion can be deployed from London to Crimea more quickly than it can be deployed from Moscow to Crimea. So, you know, that's when they suddenly, at a time when also Nicholas dies, that that's when the, the news are Alexander II becomes painfully aware that actually trying to just hold everything frozen in place has left Russia exposed and vulnerable, launches a modernization, which is, again, largely derived to improving the economy so that he can improve Russia's military, which does lead to widespread in instability and indeed his own assassination. So you, you, you do have this constant pendulum swing uh, of where do you think the biggest threat comes, inside or outside your borders? And then, of course, we get to the First World War, which was a complete catastrophe from certainly Imperial Russia's point of view. Uh, it wasn't just the Imperial Russia was forged in war. The Bolshevik regime was too. Often, I think uh, people misunderstand that. They assume it was some sort of idealistic revolution. But how intimately was Bolshevism, in your view, bound up with war? Of course, the Bolsheviks, cleverly or not, made peace with Germany, which uh, established a degree of legitimacy and power eventually for the regime. But how do you associate Bolshevism and Lenin with your narrative in Forged in War. Was Lenin simply the next version of a czar or was he trying at least to be something different? I mean, I think, see, with Lenin, he's a, he's a complex character with a complex assessment. He was trying to be something different, but precisely the circumstances in many ways didn't allow him to be different. I mean, firstly, absolutely, the, the Bolsheviks, they are not swept to power in the Great October Revolution, as it's called on a wave of mass support. Essentially, it was a, a coup by a small, efficient and dedicated revolutionary group at a time when essentially no one was, was in practice running the country, which only could have happened because of the, the colossal impact of the Second World War, sorry, the First World War, which had basically already brought down Tsarism and was sapping the will of, of those people who tried to sort of pick up the mantle afterwards. So. You know, Lenin himself, a year beforehand, had not thought he would see a revolution in his lifetime. So it was absolutely the war that created the opportunity that he took. But really more important was the, the Russian civil war that followed. Seizing power turned out to be the easy thing compared with then holding power and trying to sort of spread and this it was from an, the an incredibly brutal war, wasn't it, on both sides? Absolutely. God, uh, horrific. I mean, all civil wars tend, tend to be ugly, brutal things. But as is so often the case with Russia, you know, there it was especially, especially so. And in order to win, effectively, the Bolsheviks ditched those elements of their political philosophy, which were I, sort of, still quite idealistic, faintly democratic, and so forth. You know, there, there, there was still a certain potential within Bolshevism, one has to recognize. But all of that went by the way. The Bolshevik party became essentially a dictatorial, militarized uh, force where you know you just simply follow orders from above. If need be, you use massive levels of brutality in order to, to win. So essentially they sacrificed what one could almost call, shall I say, the soul of their party in order to win. And they did win, but that meant that they, they won not only control of what was then a devastated country because of both civil war and World War I, but also, in some ways, these, these kind of war fighting attitudes had become absolutely central. And that was what, in due course, Stalin would, would take full advantage of, because he absolutely appealed not to the airy fairy philosophers, 
but to the hard-nosed, heavy-handed sort of men who had risen during the Civil War. Well, the, one of those airy-fairy philosophers was Trotsky, but of course he was in charge of the the Bolsheviks militarily in some ways during the war, so he wasn't as airy-fairy as some of his perhaps contemporary fans uh, think of him. Was the Russian Civil War, Mark, a weird time where both the internal and external paranoia around war were combined because of course foreign powers were also involved czech troops were involved in the in the in the war the western powers hovered and were supportive of the anti bolsheviks so was it a, a particularly paranoid time in terms of warfare and violence yeah, and it definitely set the tone. I mean, look, there's no way of getting around the fact that in the interwar period, the Soviet Union as emerged was the pariah. The West you know, essentially hoped that the, the Bolsheviks would die off, in effect. But also during the Civil War, the Bolsheviks found themselves fighting the whites. They found themselves fighting nationalist secessionist forces. They found themselves fighting anarchists, other revolutionaries, and indeed, as you say, you know, Western interventions. I mean, including my my, my English grandfather and who, nationalists, uh, of course, or at least yeah, non-Russian course. nationalists who wanted to escape the the uh, the the, the, yeah. the imperial Russian Empire. Absolutely. So I think this sense of being beleaguered, that there are you know enemies all around who will take any opportunity to tear you down, as well as that there are fifth colonists, subversives, and hostile ideological forces even at home all contributed to, to the sense that basically the only way this new state can survive is essentially by becoming militarized, by imposing sort of a massive political super state over society, and by essentially being as ruthless as needed. And all of that came through. You're making me paranoid, uh, Mark, and I'm not even <laughs> Russian. Let's get to Stalin, of course. It's hard to avoid Stalin here. Um, it seems, I mean, from so many narratives from great historians like yourself and Applebaum, that Stalin essentially went to war with maybe not all Russians, but certainly the Russian peasantry who made up most of the population. Did war in, in, in the so-called interwar period between the end of the First and Second World War, was it a perpetual feature of Stalin's Russia? It was. I mean, at times we actually had it you know, very visibly during the sort of so-called Great Terror or during the collectivization campaign, which essentially saw an almost all land brought under the control of the state, whatever the peasants felt about that. And even when there wasn't, again, there was this constant uh, climate of wartime paranoia where people were being encouraged to inform on their neighbors or their classmates or whatever else when today's uh you know key bolshevik figure tomorrow will be in a show trial being forced battered and bruised by the torture meted out upon them to admit, quote unquote admit that they had been a, a western spy all along and so forth i mean paranoia was one of the many weapons that stalin used precisely to not only break the resistance or the potential resistance of society and elite alike but also to maintain his own power. And in the process, he built a war fighting economy. In 1931, he said, we are 50 or 100 years behind the advanced nations. We must make good this distance in 10. Either we do it or they destroy us. Well, he said that in 1931. 1941, the Nazis invaded. And I think in that 10 years, he had, through the most horrifically brutal means, nonetheless built the kind of industrial economy which really could sustain and fight its way through World War II. 1941, of course, Hitler invades, um, shocked Stalin. Stalin believed Hitler, not the first or the last person to be misled by him. Stalin went dark for a few days, maybe a couple of weeks. Some people think he was on the verge of a nervous breakdown. And then he kind of reinvented himself as a nationalist, almost like mm -hmm. a czar. Was this the moment where Russia reversed to form in your in your narrative, forged in war, a military history of Russia from its beginnings to today? Did Hitler's invasion of Russia simply enable Stalin to become a, a 20th century czar, no different from Peter or Catherine or, or, or Alexander? 
I think so. I mean, because it did allow him to, as you say, reinvent himself. I mean, up to this point, he had basically been fighting a war against the Soviet people, destroying every single sector that could pose some kind of threat to him. This actually allowed him instead to become the avatar of the nation. And as you say, I mean, when, when he first when he first comes out of this period of nervous breakdown, whatever it was that, that, that follows the initial invasion, a man who notoriously did not like doing public broadcasts because he was very self-conscious of his what for most russians was a rather funny georgian accent yeah he was no fdr was he absolutely not but nonetheless he comes out and he actually gives this this national speech and he doesn't he doesn't sort of open it with comrades but as brothers and sisters you know he's now appealing to the kind of the loamy nationalism of essentially the, the russian people we see the churches, which have been suppressed, begin to be reopened precisely for this reason. Even Soviet generals suddenly acquire new uniforms, which are basically echoes of Tsarist generals' uniforms. So, you know, in, in anything from its state iconography all the way to, to its rhetoric or whatever, you do have Stalin essentially trying to draw on every aspect of, of Russian history that is convenient. And the very fact that they end up calling World War II the Great Patriotic War. Well, the first patriotic war, as they describe it, is the war against Napoleon. So th this is a man who is clearly now reaching back into the toolbox of history in order to construct for himself a, you know, a, a new notion of the state. And yes, so much of it does depend on czarism and the same sense that in some ways the, the monarch is separate from the people but stands for the people it may not be because he have, is a divine right monarch like the Tsar. Instead, he's legitimated by Marxism-Leninism that for most Russians is as distant a concept, frankly, as heaven. Yeah, and he was he and Lenin, of course, were, were fetishized in the same way as leaders. Did we get all of this wrong in the Cold War, we, the West, Mark, in assuming that, that Soviet victory in the Second World War and then occupation of Eastern Europe um, and its rivalry with the United States was somehow premised on ideology, on communism, whereas given your narrative, your thesis of, of Russia always being forged in war, we should have understood post-Stalin's Russia after 1948 um, as, 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 a, as a military empire, not much more or less? I mean, it's difficult because clearly ideology matters to some Soviet leaders as well as some Soviet citizens, though I would say decreasingly so. And so too is, in some ways, ideology is the, the mantle in which they wrap themselves. You know, you, most countries tend to find legitimating narratives especially if they're going to be involved in attempts to you know, expand their power across the world or whatever. You know, whether we're talking about the uh, you know, shining city upon a hill, whether we're talking about, you know, divine right, religious um, sort of mandates, or whether we're talking about the fact that you, you have an ideology which conveniently sort of says, well, this will be good for all of humanity, so let us impose it. But yes, when it comes down to it, it's hard to see how the Soviet leadership behaved that differently from how one could have imagined the Tsarist leadership doing that had they been in a similar position. Because, of course, after World War II, suddenly they're a superpower. They have some massive armed forces. And very soon they have nuclear weapons, which more or less means that you don't have to worry about actually being occupied by an enemy anymore because you can basically threaten thermonuclear Armageddon. So, you know, the, the, the whole nature of conflict has changed and it's going to be projected out often into... You know, uh, proxy wars in the sort of post-colonial world and, and, and such like. But when it comes down to it, maybe I'm being over cynical here, I tend to feel that ideology is just used to justify what they do rather than being why they do it. So fast forwarding to 1989 and another crisis of another Russian militarized regime. Was the collapse of communism, um, in many ways, Mark, uh, equivalent to the collapse of czarism? And then in terms of your thesis, were, were there windows of agency? I mean, many, many 
books have been written about the possibility of creating a, a democratic Russia after the collapse of Tsarism, the potential for the February Revolution. Uh, similar books have been written about Gorbachev and, um, and Yeltsin and the potential for a democratic Russia. What's your narrative here? Was there agency? You keep on saying there is, but it doesn't sound as if in practice there is much agency for the people who run Russia. I mean, it's hard, but I mean, again, I think there is absolutely agency. And, and if one look, takes a look at Gorbachev, I mean, in some ways, the problem there was that Gorbachev was arguably the last true believer in the Soviet Union. I mean, this is a guy who still believed in Marxism, Leninism, and he You're felt a bit of a dimwit, really. I mean, <laughs> even a five year old would have understood that it didn't work. Well, he, I mean, again, yes, whether well, he wasn't it was, up there with yeah. Catherine or Peter the Great or Lenin. Um, he no. wasn't a, a great thinker, was he? No, exactly. I mean, I, I, I think that he, he deserves credit for actually being arguably one of, the, I think, if not the first Russian rulers who, when it came down to it, did not use, was not willing to use violence to maintain his position, and that is, I think, quite a, a significant thing, for both in terms of what it says about him, but also actually for, for Russia's future. But no, I mean, let's, let's suggest that he's like, that I mean, fact, coming back to Gorbachev, it, 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 it's, it's not really surprising then that he's beloved in the West as this uh, sort of chubby, huggable Russian <laughs> uncle and hated in Russia. I mean, it, it was great for us in the West, but not so good for Russia. So he didn't have an alternative. It wasn't as if he had a... Uh, a, a free market ideal. He, he wasn't imagining Russia as Singapore um, or South Korea. So he, he was bound to fail, wasn't he? I mean, I think he was bound to fail ultimately. But again, it's a question of how he fails and when he fails. And and here, you know, it's it's not just simply about agency. It's about almost chance. I mean, had the hardliners not tried to launch a coup against him in August of 1991, which essentially cut him off at the knees and allowed his main rival, Boris Yeltsin, to, to essentially come to dominate Russia, then we may have well have seen a different kind of process. I mean, I think ultimately, would the Soviet Union have survived another five years, 10 years? No, not in my opinion. But nonetheless, it may well have moved in, in different directions. But the point is, you know, again, if, if one comes to, to agency, I mean, again, likewise, you know, Boris Yeltsin, the man who, who replaces him, you know, this is a man who is essentially a destroyer rather than a creator. When he has a target, when he has an enemy, he's incredibly effective and focused. But he too, in some ways, I would say he had even less of a vision for what he wanted for Russia than Gorbachev. You know, he knew he wanted to beat Gorbachev. But then when he had power, that's when he basically sort of ran out of, of ideas. So, yes, one, one could say, well, the, 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 these silly Russians, they, they can never basically break out of this cycle. And yes, they still haven't yet. But the point is, no country breaks out of its cycle until the point when it does. You know, and then, yes, we, we, we can look at, at all these failed moments. But the point is, there were opportunities. If, if Gorbachev had been a different person, if he had not been um, essentially had his political career destroyed in 1991, if Yeltsin had been a different person, things could have been different. Or indeed, if we had adopted different policies in the 1990s. I mean, I think we, oh, we yeah, also share yeah, a certain amount. Blame. Lots of books have been written about that. Meanwhile, well, Gorbachev was destroying himself. Yeltsin was drinking. There was a young KGB officer in Dresden in 89 who was reading history like Lenin did in, when he was in Zurich in 1917. How, um, uh, how do you fit Putin into your narrative in, in, in Forged In More. As I said, your, 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 last time you were on the show, you were talking about Putin's war. So a lot of the narrative in, um, in, in this work is built around your experience of Putin. You're an analyst in your day job, so you spend a lot of time looking at Putin's Russia. Was, in your view, it, it's so hard to tell. So many books have been written about this. Did Putin know what he was doing, or was he himself... Uh, used by the the military industrial or the the surveillance services in Russia to reestablish the old world yeah i don't think putin had some grand strategy and to be perfectly honest i don't think putin was as it were aiming for the presidency what he was was like so many other figures in the 1990s 
desperately on the make, leveraging what he had, which was actually administrative resource initially as the deputy mayor of St. Petersburg, to make money, to make connections, to, to basically do business. He was a, an administrative entrepreneur in that respect. A successful one. A successful one, exactly. And, and he rose as everyone's favorite bag man. He was the guy who you wanted to have at your back, who would make sure that all your problems went away and that no one looked into your big deals and so forth. And he was basically plucked out of relative obscurity by a cabal of people around Boris Yeltsin, who realized that he you know, basically Yeltsin was, as you say, drinking and drugging himself to death and was no longer able to be in charge. And they wanted someone whom they thought was going to be a well, not just um, sober and upright, um, but also biddable, cynical front man. And they thought Putin was that guy. And so they picked him. They very quickly elevated him. And then once he was in power, Putin made it clear that he wasn't willing simply to continue just simply just to be their bag man, but would rather was going to be in charge. But the thing is, none of this is because of a long term strategy. This is all about people responding to particular situations. And so Putin suddenly finds himself in the year 2000 president. And yes, he knows, broadly speaking, that he wants to reestablish order in the country, which has spent 10 years basically in, in anarchy. He's a nationalist. He wants his country to be regarded seriously. He, he thinks that Russia is a great power, really has its birthright. But I don't think he has any vision at first of how you get there. And so, particularly in his early reign, he's essentially flailing around. At one point, he's saying that maybe Russia should join NATO. At another point, he's basically inveighing against the West for trying to berate him for human rights abuses during its war suppressing Chechnya. You know, again, this, this is someone who's still coming to terms with the nature of his job and his challenges. And what he does is he reaches back into history. You said, you know, he reads history. You know, that's about the one thing he really does read. And he looks at history as in some ways providing him a guide and a toolbox for how he's going to do his job. Did we miss a trick, uh, Mark, with, with Putin? Were there moments where, because clearly the, the current situation is, is not something that we celebrate in the West, the Ukrainian invasion, or, you know, military buildup. Um, were there moments where the West could have understood Putin's dilemma and re-architected, quote unquote, our relationship with him? So we acknowledge some of the challenges and pressures on him, but at the same time, try to forge a Russia that isn't purely associated with war. I mean, I think I'll be honest. I think that actually our main mistake. I hope you're always 1990s. honest, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think that our main mistakes were actually in the 1990s. That was a much more fluid moment. And in some you mean ways, with Gorbachev and Yeltsin? Well, with Yeltsin above all. I mean, basically, we didn't really care about Russia. We just wanted Russia not to be a problem. And so therefore, it's the neoliberal we, argument that, that that we were just sweeping them into an economy and, and all we wanted was profit. And also, we just basically wanted to ensure that Russia was not going to come basically sort of get in the way of our other policies. So twice in particular, when Yeltsin went beyond the bounds of democratic practice. 1993, he shells his own parliament to resolve a constitutional crisis. 1996, essentially, the election is rigged in order to stop the communists from winning. And we, because we didn't like that particular parliament and because we didn't like the communists, we didn't actually raise any red flags at that point. And then we get surprised that the Russians think that we're sanctimonious hypocrites and that democracy is always a sort of a stage managed sham. But anyway, going on to, 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 to Putin, I mean, I think the problem is this, that I think Putin himself never really understood the West. He, he does have this very zero sum notion that you know everyone is basically trying to do everyone else down. There's a limit to how far we could have exceeded. Well, there are people, uh, Mark, in the West, like a certain Donald Trump, <laughs> who perhaps does conform to Putin's worldview or vice versa. Absolutely, which is why Putin can get on with Trump. I mean, I don't suggest for a moment that they are sort of great friends or whatever, but I just do think that they are, shall I say, on, on a closer bandwidth to each other. But the point is that also there were times when, when we needed to be a little bit more robust. You know, the, the old adage of speak softly and carry a big stick, too often we spoke loudly and waved a small twig. That, for example, when, when Putin invaded Georgia in 2008, we lambasted him, but we basically did nothing. 
Was that and Obama again, or Bush or both? Oh, gosh. That, this is American politics. Don't ask me about that. I'm trying to think. Um, no, I'm sorry. I, <laughs> well, it's probably Bo. Yeah, but I mean, but but generally speaking, I mean, then we, you know, with Obama, we have, we've and yes, it was Obama actually, because then there was the the offer of of a reset, um, very very quickly. Well, but Obama is very good at speaking loudly and carrying a twig, but 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 the, it established this notion in 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 Putin's head precisely that that, that we can be safely ignored, but that also. Nonetheless, that, that we keep being censorious towards Putin. Um, I think this was our problem. I, I have no problem with, with, with criticizing Putin and his various misdeeds. I also have no problem with responding robustly when he acts in ways that, that, that break the world order. But on the other hand, our problem was precisely the disconnect between the two, that we, we spoke loudly and did nothing. And therefore, we shouldn't be surprised that he felt that, in fact, we were a faded, declining, or ultimately sort of fairly pointless force and that he could do increasingly what he wanted to do. Mark, you, you write a very entertaining uh, column for the London Times. One of your recent pieces is entitled Putin is moody and, is, and, and, and misfiring. His regime is getting worse. But you also wrote a piece recently suggesting that Russia is building an axis of the anti-West. And I'm quoting you here. This should be the title of your new book. Is it springtime for the authoritarians? So where are we, Mark, in October 2024 when it comes to Putin's Russia? Um, is it springtime for the authoritarians or is it fall? Are we coming to an end of this moment? Are we just before the First World War? Or are we at the beginning of, of, of an even more militarized Putin-esque or post-Putin state in Russia? I mean, I think the interesting thing is that you get very different visions if you look, shall we say, out of Russia's boundaries or, or within it. I mean, looking out, yes, this is a time in which actually Putin can be really quite happy with what, what's going on. That it seems that, that generally democracy, democratic countries are sliding into sort of populist uh, turmoil. You have the UN Secretary General coming to Kazan in Tatarstan to shake hands with Putin during a, a BRICS summit, but not willing to go to the, the, the peace summit that uh, Ukraine calls and such like. So basically, and being does banned from be. Israel, which only adds yes. to um, absolutely. So you know, you know, put all this together, and it does seem to be that in fact the 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 high water mark of Western slash democratic power has definitely passed. But the interesting thing is, if you look inside Russia, actually, there are growing strains. I mean, the, the economy can basically sustain this current war effort for, I think, at least another couple of years. We always hear that. A couple of years, though, in in, in Silicon Valley, a couple of years is, is a couple of centuries. We've always heard this ever since he invaded. Oh, the economy won't work. It can't last for more than a couple of years. And it's always a couple of years, Mark. And a couple of years just gets kicked down. Uh, it becomes the can that gets kicked down the road. Yeah, I mean, in fairness, I've not been a... a oh, I'm not saying you, a couple of generally. Years. I'm, I'm I mean, not... but I think what we can see is precisely we're beginning to see the, the stresses beginning to build up on, on the Russian economy. You know, you, you've got a, a base inter, you know, base rate from the, from the central bank of about 19%. Um, you have a labor market, which is now absolutely at, at, at full stretch. There's no room to expand the, the defense industrial complex except by poaching from the rest of the economy, which is happening. And generally speaking, there is a, a growing sense of disquiet within both the elite and the masses, which doesn't mean to say that they want to surrender. I mean, on the whole, they still, you know, they may not have wanted Russia to get involved in this war in Ukraine, but once it is involved, they would rather it win than lose. But a sense, as it were, that 24 years on, Putin is no longer the same Putin, or maybe that the needs of the country have have changed. I mean, that is really quite. He's quite moody palpable. and misfiring. That's a sort of. Yeah, exactly. The, I mean, he he blundered dramatically. Last year's military mutiny by the Wagner mercenary group, you know, was very yeah, much you because write he about had failed in your, in your book downfall, Prizhazhin Putin and the new fight for the future of Russia. And I appreciate the uh, little plug there, but yes, I mean, but that. That happened precisely because Putin 
put off and put off dealing with a crisis. People were telling him that the rivalry between the mercenaries and the defense ministry was becoming a real challenge. But because it was a tough decision, he didn't really know what to do. He did nothing. Now, I think often what we're, what we're finding is that sense of there are a lot of people who are, we have to recognize, kind of smart and effective managers in Russia, the technocrats running the economy, some of the generals and so forth. But the sense of a lack of political leadership from the top is is really quite quite sort of clear. So if I was going to play the historical narrative sort of game, in some ways this is a little bit more more like the start of World War One than than World War Two. There is that sense of a, a monarch who is both absolute, but also not really up to the challenges of the moment. Doesn't necessarily mean we're going to have another Bolshevik revolution by all means, but nonetheless, I think you know it is clear that. As I say, when, when Putin looks at home compared with looking abroad, it's not quite such a positive picture. Final question, um, Mark, as I'm sure you know, there's an election in the US in a couple of weeks. Um, if Trump is elected, it clearly wants to be in bed with Putin. Whether Putin wants to be in bed with Trump is another matter. Um, might we be returning not to the period before the first world war but the period after napoleon uh to a kind of concert of europe of incredibly conservative states bent on quashing one kind of democracy or another i mean if 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 trump comes to power he clearly has no great affection for western europe or the eu uh he's clearly sympathetic to putin is it conceivable that if uh, Trump comes to power. The, the 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 Republican Party in the U.S. is ambivalent about Russia. They're certainly not going back to the Cold War. Might they force a, a, a peace, quote unquote, in in Ukraine um, and, and create a new world between them? This kind of militarized kleptocracy combination of Trump and Putin, or is that? A little too fictional, too pat and convenient. I mean, I think it it represents a kind of a, an extreme end of the, the, the fan of possibilities. I mean, absolutely, you know, Trump has claimed that he would very quickly impose a ceasefire on Ukraine. And can on, he do that, war. Mark? I mean, you wrote an interesting piece in the Spectator about Zelensky's victory plan, un, unlikely to impress Europe. Um, whatever that victory plan is, if it's not going to impress Europe, it's certainly not going to impress Donald Trump. Yeah, look, he, he in theory could, because what he's threatening is that he would tell the Russians, if you don't accept a ceasefire, we will massively increase our aid to the Ukrainians. And more to the point, he would say to the Ukrainians, if you don't accept a ceasefire, we will stop our aid. And let's be honest, Europe can stump up money for Ukraine, but it cannot make up the shortfall in terms of military capacity if America pulls out, because you can't basically buy Patriot missiles off Amazon and so forth. So, I mean, I think in theory, is it possible? The interesting thing is if one looks at the Russian press and discourse, they're actually much more cynical and skeptical about Trump. They, they appreciate what he says and they think, oh, yeah, wouldn't that be nice? Because a ceasefire clearly would, would be in Putin's interests, but they also know that he tends to talk more than he acts. And they were to a degree burnt by his first presidency in which for all his talk about his great relationship with Putin, actually policy towards Russia at the end of it was tougher than at any point since 1991, not because of Trump, but because of Congress. And Trump just simply didn't want to put any resources into stopping it. You know, basically, Trump is interested in Trump, full stop. So I think from, from the Russians' point of view, they regard this as a little bit of a win-win. If Trump gets elected, whether or not he, he carries forward with his policies over Ukraine, you know, he is the disruptor in chief. He will create all sorts of chaos, dislocations and dismay within NATO, within the wider Western world, and maybe room for all kinds of deals on sanctions or the like. And if Trump loses, well, there is the assumption that his partisans will cry foul and that there will be a lengthy period of disruption. And from Russians' point of view, disruption of America or indeed any aspect of the West is almost as good as state capture. So, I mean, at the moment, they are they are feeling, I think, surprisingly comfortable about the, the forthcoming election, because ultimately they think that Trump may not be their friend, but he is rather more the enemy of so many of the institutions at the heart of the West. Well, Mark Galliotti, I hope it won't be another two years before we get you back on the show. One of the wisest men on uh, on the history of Russia, on Putin's Russia.
uh, the author of an important new book, Forged in War, A Military History of Russia from Its Beginnings to Today. It's out uh, in early November. Thank you so much, Mark. It's, it's probably not pleasure. the most encouraging narrative, but it's more important to be honest than sympathetic. So thank you so much, Mark. Keep safe and we'll talk to you uh, in the not too distant future. Thank you so much. Thank you. Can I step on the